fam another famous photographer. Um, vastly different than the past two that we've talked about. Really different and really brought some different things to the game. So we'll get right into it. His name is Richard Avedon. That's a picture of him. Um, so very influential photographer in the world of photography, like I've been saying about a lot of them, but for different reasons, and hopefully you'll see why. Had a real insight to things. So Richard Avedon. And in his later life, after he became very famous with photography, people didn't call him Richard Avedon. Some people called him by his first name. Uh, a lot of people just called him by Avedon. He was known just by the word Avedon. Anyhow, let's get going on him. So uh, early life, he was born in 23. Not really important. I'm not going to quiz you on that. But again, I give you these numbers really more for the idea of when they became relevant in accordance to t the history of the world and stuff like that. In the fact that if we think about what happened about 20 years or so after he was born, it's World War II, uh, he grew up in New York City. Uh, his family owned a dress shop. So his dad was a very famous dress maker. Uh, not like a Christian Dior or and something like that, but still he made dresses, knew, knew a lot about women's fashion. Uh, he briefly attended Columbia University, attended there for a little while uh, before the old WWII came along, and in 1942, he joined the Merchant Marines. So we sort of have to understand what the Merchant Marines are, who they were, or what they did, and stuff like that. They're, nowadays, uh, they're called the Seabees, they're part of the Navy. Uh, back then, the Merchant Marines were sort of a separate entity from the other uh, branches of the military, in a way, in the fact that they were the ones who got things from one place to another. Um, so they were the ones who, who brought the tanks over and the food and all the supplies over from one area of the world to another end of the, wor the world. His job, Richard Avaton's job in the Merchant Marine, was he was a photographer. Um, and so his job as a photographer was he photographed all the men that were going over to war over in Europe. So every day for, you know, 12 to 15 hours a day, he photographed these men as they came in for their class A's on and then went over to Europe to get photographed. So nowadays a little different getting your photograph taken with your, uh, for your official portraits. Um, you know, if, if any of you have served, depending on when you served, it's vastly different. Nowadays it's all digital. You, have, you come in basically in your uh, class B t-shirt and they come in and they digitally put a uniform on you. So you don't have to get all gussied up. But part of this was the part of this work that he did was sort of training for his photography in later life as far as getting to learn how to control people, how to get that inner look into them. Because here you have these men coming in, you know, he's photographing a couple hundred a day probably. Um, and so he's doing this day in and day out, day in and day out. And it becomes monotonous. And it's like he sees the basic the basic uh, standard look on most of the men's faces. It's always the same sort of look to things. So his early career, right after the war, uh, in 1946, he becomes the staff photographer for a couple different magazines. Number one, he becomes a staff photographer for Harper's Bazaar. So there he is, 23 years old, becomes a staff chief photographer for Harper's Bazaar, and also becomes a contributing photographer for Life and for Vogue magazine. That's about as big a home run out of the gate as one can get. Um, you just don't get bigger hits like that out of, out of the gate for starting a career like this. So what made him different? Why did, why did Harper's Bazaar hire him? Uh, and why did Life in Vogue you know, use his work right from the get-go? Well, let's explore that and let's look at some of his, his early photography. So his early career was fashion photography. So this is one of his most famous fashion works. I'm going to show you a couple different pieces of his fashion work. So here we have this, port this picture of this woman. And so we have to think about what it's portraying. It's, a, it's an ad for the dress, or the coat rather. And so this woman's wearing a coat. Well, here's some problems. Number one is you can't see, is it really buttons? I guess you can sort of see a button near her chin, but you can't see the button. You can't really see if there's a belt. You can't see a lot of things on there. Um, and it's not, about the dr it's not about the coat. It's really about more what does it feel like to wear that coat. So here you have a woman in Paris who's so ecstatic about wearing this coat that she's willing to carry an umbrella and jump off a curb even though it's not raining. But it's the feeling that one would get from wearing the coat. So that's what really sort of started to set the fashion uh, photography world on its ear by Avedon's work is the fact that he didn't really care about the look of the, of the product. It's more about what the person felt like wearing it. Here's another great example. So here you can't even see the front of the dress you can't even see, is it a button-up? Does it have pockets? What kind of buttons does it have? 
Doesn't matter, because what's the message? If you think about it, if you look at this picture kind of closely, what's the message in the photograph? Most people would probably anticipate that the message in this photograph is that if you were to wear that dress, you're going to get a lot of attention because you see those three men, you know, just mesmerized by this woman twirling on the cement area. Pictures like this, um, very involved, technically stunning imagery as far as the ability to capture a moment like this. Doesn't look like it, it almost looks, maybe looks a little bit like, like a snapshot, like a little bit like what we saw with Robert Frank last week, but vastly different as far as he was a master of exposing with light. If we look at the light on her, the light on her face is perfect, it's very soft, whereas the light, look at the man, it's just to her right, behind her and to the right. Um, the light's hitting his eyes a very special way, and it's a vastly different look. So it's a very technically a hard picture to set up. This was an image that probably took four or five hours to set, the, set this up for the look that he eventually ended up with. <laughs> this is an ad for the pearls. So I know most women, when they go to go out, they don't, <laughs> they don't wear bunny ears. But this is the, again, it's the feeling of what it's like to wear this stuff. And so it's that feeling of getting things ready before you go out on a date or go out on the town or whatever you're going to go out to do. So it's more about the feeling of things rather than just the actual item itself. Because you can barely see the pearls, but it's the feeling. Okay. Lots of pictures of the same model again and again. And again, doesn't really show the dress all that well, but shows more about what it feels like to wear it. He had a bit of a sense of humor. He would get models that had, he, so he did this whole, a series of pictures where it was these models and they'd have uh, animals, and or mostly dogs, that had a very striking look, very similar to the model themselves. <clears throat> In his early career, uh, he, was, he was, like I said, a home run out of the gate. And so he was so famous that he became uh, sort of uh, world renowned as far as his uh, fashion photography. There's some more. This is another one where there's, Couples roller skating. It's for the it's for the overcoat that the woman's wearing. Is the ad is what the ad is for. Again, this is what you'd feel like if you wear that overcoat that you're wearing, willing to go skate, you know, roller skating in the middle of a city. Again, it's for the dress on this one. And also, too, there's some real hidden meanings there. As far as you look at the guy on the very far left hand side with the cue ball and hitting the cue ball, that look on his face is there's some. There's some hidden suggestions. There's lots of hidden suggestions in Avedon's work on this stuff. But it became so famous that Hollywood decided to make a movie about it. And it's a movie called Funny Face. And it had Fred Astaire in it and Audrey Hepburn. Very fun, famous movie. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of the first intro to this movie. This entire intro was made by Avedon himself. Avedon himself actually cut this and made this part of the film for the intro to the film. So he actually used a lot of the pictures that he was already shooting, and it also became a style with him as far as some of the pictures he shot here. Notice a lot of the portraits that he's shooting has a white or a gray background. Most everything he shoots from here on out in his career is a white or a gray background for the most part. The other thing is pictures had, if you notice these pictures have like a black edge around them, a lot of his work from here on out in his career had a white or gray background and had that black edge. That black edge is actually the very edge of the film itself. And there's a real distinct reason as to why he's showing you these edges of the film like that. So let me go on to this. So he also had this thing, for a while he was into this thing called jump photography, where he would have the models moving around and jumping. Uh, he was able to do this because of the advent of electronic flash, where uh, you're able to capture motion much easier than you were before, because before this, before the 40s and stuff like that, and even into the 40s, your photography was done with hot lights, which mean they're lights that can, although they can light a scene, they're not bright enough to be able to actually capture motion. But because they're like, he's able to use electronic flash, he's able to capture motion. In fact, he went so far as that not only did he have the models jump, he jumped. 
So he's jumping around as he's actually taking the picture of these models and things like this. So he was into that. But by far and away, the thing he's probably most famous for is his portraits. He did a lot of famous portraits. And that's not either one of them right there. That's not a portrait he took. But that's a movie that came out about eight or ten years ago. It's called The King's Speech. Uh, really good movie. If you haven't seen The King's Speech, you really should. I don't think it's on any services currently, but I'm sure that it will be back on your Netflixes or Amazons pretty soon. Anyhow, it's about the uh, royal family back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And that Jeffrey, uh, uh, Colin Firth, becomes the king. But he becomes king not because his father died. He becomes king because his brother abdicates the throne. So who's his brother? The dude on the right. That's his brother. And so the, the problem was that when his brother became king after their father died, um, he wanted to marry the woman that you see pictured here on the left, Wallace Simpson. And so um, she, the problem was is that, A, she was an American, although they didn't have that much of a problem with her being an American. The bigger problem they had is she was divorced twice, and she was still married to another guy. So that was the, the basically the parliament said, look, um, you can be king, but you can't marry her. So he abdicated. Abdicating means that he gave up the throne and let his brother have it in order to be able to be married to Wallace Simpson. So long story short is him and Wallace Simpson lived the rest of their lives together, and they loved pugs. You can see the pug pictured there. They had 14 pugs. So they loved, loved, loved the dogs. So they were set, ready to take a picture with Avedon. This is in the mid-50s, like 56, I think it was. They're set to take a picture with Avedon. They were at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, this big, huge, fancy hotel. And so Avedon, at, the, at this point, was so famous that he didn't have to set up his backgrounds or his lights or his cameras. He just had to show up. He had, he had um, assistants that would do all that. So he wanted to take portraits that were a little bit deeper than your standard glossy portraits like like if you think back at the pictures i showed you of him taking pictures of the servicemen in the in world war ii those were very plasticky they were very just stand, sit there snap a picture get away sit there snap a picture get away so he wanted to take pictures that were a little deeper than that had a little bit more showed a little bit more below the skin than that so sometimes he would have to tell them a story so he did that with this uh with uh, with these folks and what he did was is he purposely showed up late he made them wait like about 15 minutes he shows up 15 minutes late and as he walks in he says i'm so sorry i'm late i was taking a cab here from my studio and as the cab turned onto fifth avenue it hit a dog and it killed the dog and of course these two people being avid dog lovers especially pugs were shocked by him saying this oh my gosh i can't believe you were in a cab and the dog hit the cab hit a dog and the dog died well, he was telling them a lie because he wanted their reaction. So this is the port that he got after he told them that they had, they had just hit a dog. Now, that's not exactly a portrait. I'd, if I had a portrait of that like that, I'm not sure I'd put that on my wall. But that wasn't his goal. His goal in photography at this point, his portraits were to show a deeper side of somebody rather than just the smiling plastic outside of people. So from here on, he did that. He has a very famous portrait of uh, Charles Chaplin. So this is Charles Chaplin in his later years in the, in the 50s. And so Charlie Chaplin had a little bit of an issue with, uh, he liked to date younger girls. And so the U.S. government was on to him. And so he decided to split the country sort of at the last minute. But before he did, he went in and actually had a portrait session with Avedon. And the very last picture, he says, my good chap, will you mind if I take a special picture and so he's Avedon's like yeah okay whatever and so uh Charlie Chaplin leans his head down sort of forward so you can't really see his face and he comes up with this sort of thing this look that you see here in this photograph where he's pointing his fingers up and that's a British thing of of basically he's snubbing us he's sort of flipping us off here that's the 1950s British version of how to flip you off because he split the country he was booked on passage to get on a ship out of, out of the country and it wouldn't be expedited extradited uh, for what he was doing with young girls. Uh, he didn't come back to the, country, the United States for another 20-something years. Uh, so that's his little flip-off to the country. <laughs> Lots of other famous portraits. This is Marlon Brando. So Marlon Brando was, fa was famous throughout most of his acting career, but very famous at this point. This is the late 50s. And so instead of your standard you know, 8x10 glossy, smiling portrait of somebody, he decides to take a little bit of insight. So really some insight to things. And again, now at this point, like I said, all of his, most all of his portraits, like 98% of them, are either on a white background or a gray background. 
And the other thing is he has these black borders. You can sort of see it there. You can really see it here. This is a picture of Orson Welles, the famous director. And you can see these cut-ins. So these cut-ins on this, on this image are from, the, are from the film holders. So this one here was shot with a very large film. This is a 4x5 camera. And so those corner, those where it's curved on the sides is, the, is where the film holder is holding the film into the back of the camera. He's doing that to show us that he doesn't crop them. He shoots them exactly as is. So lots and lots of famous portraits. Here's one of, of um, Alfred Hitchcock, famous director. Here's one, a very haunting image of, of Malcolm X. So if you don't know who Malcolm X is, you probably have heard of him. I'm sure you had to have heard of Malcolm X, especially in our climate that we're in right now. Um, this was very, very much a haunting image as far as this is what a lot of people thought of Malcolm X. He didn't think badly of him, but he sort of wanted to sort of help portray that a little bit. He had a very famous session once with Marilyn Monroe. This is, a, this is for an ad. And so this technically was very uh, hard to do, especially given the time of the early 60s when he shot this. This is 60, 61 when he took this picture. And so um, what, the reason I show so many famous photographers is not so much that this is a history of photography, but rather to be influenced on how photography can, in, uh, can work. In the fact that, you know, you can hear a good song and be influenced. You know, you, we can look at different uh, famous musical artists and how they're influenced by other artists. Well, in photography, I think it's the same thing. You can be influenced. And so um, one point I did a, pro a project once for one of my classes at my master's degree stuff of this was an inspiration for me to take this picture of uh, these pictures of Marilyn Monroe was one way for me to sort of be inspired, inspired to take a picture like this. This is my son, Scott. He was only three at the time. He's 22 now. Uh, so it's sort of the same thing. It was my inspired by the Marilyn Monroe picture to take a picture like this. So let's get back to Marilyn. Let's get back to the story. There's, there's this picture of Marilyn Monroe. Again, gray background, black edges. But what was important about this picture is the fact that with it, he doesn't see Marilyn anymore. So I don't know if you know the story about Marilyn Monroe, but she's not, or that wasn't her birth name. She was born Norma Jean, um, started with a B, last name was B. Anyways, um, she's Mar Norma Jean. And so here you have this woman, Norma Jean, portraying Marilyn Monroe, and Marilyn Monroe is in a movie, and she's portraying something else. So very, very, uh, very deep on the concept. It's almost like Inception level deep. Anyhow, so she was always had to have it have that sort of pers that Marilyn Monroe persona sort of on all the time. And after this whole day session of taking dance pictures, like I showed you a few images ago, she sits down for a few minutes to rest, and he sees this, and he takes her picture, and he doesn't see Marilyn Monroe anymore. He sees Norma Jean. So you wanted to see just a little bit below the normal surface. Took lots of portraits of lots of famous people. Obviously the Beatles, part of the famous group. <clears throat> the Kennedys. So interesting thing about this picture, this was for the back cover of a book about JFK. And so this is the picture that the publisher picked. And Richard Avedon didn't like that they picked that picture. Why? Why wouldn't Richard Avedon like this picture? Because he liked this picture more but the publisher didn't like it because it put the two of them in equal light so i'm not agreeing with this don't get me wrong i'm not agreeing with this that's what the publisher wanted this is what richard avedon wanted because he thought they should be equals lots of famous portraits of people and a lot of times he would he would have fun with them so here's here's uh barbara streisand and she's got a bit of a longer nose so definitely definitely making fun of the longer nose thing Picture of Ronald Reagan. So if we look at the picture, and again, I've been sort of pushing the idea of looking at pictures in a critical way, not critical, critical as far as being um, negative about them, but we look at them like, how did he take it? Where did he take it? So if we look at this picture, where was the camera in accordance to Ronald Reagan? Was it above him at the same level or below? Well, if we look at it critically, we realize that the camera was slightly below and looking up. So when you do that to a person, when you take a picture from below looking up, what does that do to their stature? You know, what does it do to their look? Well, a lot of people tend to think that that makes them look very heroic, very much like a statue. And so that's what he did with a few people. He did that with Ronald Reagan. He also did it with Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
So instead of shooting straight above, he shot from slightly below and gives them this sort of um, monumental look, this look like a, this huge statue above us. He also took some very famous portraits of people that you may not know of, but once I tell you, it's, it'll be hopefully enlightening as to why he sh shot it this way. So this is Dr. Robert Oppenheimer. So some of you may know who Robert Oppenheimer is. Some of you probably don't know who Robert Oppenheimer is. You've maybe never heard of that name. But Robert, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer was the gentleman who invented the atomic weapon. He invented the atomic bomb. So he didn't invent it because he was thrilled to do it. He invented it because the, the government pressured him to do it and because he knew that if he didn't make it, someone else would. And maybe it wouldn't be our country that did it. So... You know, a portrait that kind of person. It's not that I don't. It's not that I'm trying to portray him as evil, or it's, or it's not that that Abaddon was trying to portray him as evil. But I think that you know, you don't want a happy, smiling, happy-go-lucky type of portrait on a person who made a weapon of that magnitude. And it's certainly the case here. <clears throat> this is Paul Tibbets. I think Paul Tibbets. I didn't hear of Oppenheimer. Who am I, how am I supposed to know who Paul Tibbets is? Well, Paul Tibbets was in the Air Force. And he was a pilot for the Air Force. And he was a pilot that flew the plane called the Enola Gay. And the Enola Gay was the airplane that dropped the very first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. So, again, a really deep portrait. If you think about what this guy has to go through in his life, the fact that he knows he flew the plane that did that. And, again, it's not like he had a choice. He was given a mission. Here's your mission. Fly the plane to X and fly it back. So, but still the, 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 the guilt and everything else that this man must have had to live with through his life is really, to me, tremendously portrayed in this portrait. All right, let's show a video. Now, this video, before I show it, uh, is very 80s-ish. Okay, so it's got very 80s-ish looking um, uh, uh, cuts and also very 80s-ish music. But just be prepared for onslaught of 80s. We were in Los Angeles, and we'd already started the shoot, and we were doing fashion, just kind of fashion pictures. They were okay. And I said, do you have any special things that you like? And she said, I like snakes. I said, you like snakes? So we called an animal place, and they brought that incredible snake. I held the snake which is quite an experience. And Dick said... Oh. Oops. When she says D Dick, she means Richard Avedon. Sorry, I should have said that. And we'd already started the shoot. Just kind of fashion pictures. They were okay. And I said, do you have any special things that you like? And she said... I like snakes. I said, you like snakes? So we called an animal place and they brought that incredible snake. I held the snake, which is quite an experience. And Dick said, would you do it in the nude? And she said, yes, sure. And she lay down, and the snake wound around her body and up her body and got to her ear and kissed her. And he took the picture, and I had tears rolling down my cheeks. I couldn't believe it. It was magical, completely magical. When the snake kissed her ear and the tongue went into her ear, the shoot was over. I mean, we couldn't speak. It was absolutely extraordinary. I wish I hadn't put that bracelet on. Um, because I thought it became kind of a fashion statement. And I thought the picture was something else. I would have liked her to be completely nude. 
So on the picture, here's a black and white version of it. Um, in her description of it, she talks about how the stake just magically coiled up and things like that. And I'm not denying that it did, but we do also have to sort of face reality here. The other sort of insight to it, uh, when I did a little more investigating, is the fact that when this picture was taken, he had her lay down. This is a cement slab in a studio. So the cement is very cold. Snakes are naturally attracted to not being cold. And so, of course, the snake, by all means, decided to go up and lay on her to take the picture. And there's a number of pictures where the snake hadn't quite got it to her ear, and eventually the snake did go up and started to, to probe in that area where her ear is. Ear is. And as they say uh, that flattery is the, f is the sincerest, or the uh, copying is the sincerest form of flattery, so other people have done the same thing with the picture. Here you have Lego, and then you also have, of course, Marge Simpson doing it. So anyways, so let's go back to him. So um, Richard Avedon, when he took pictures, especially some of his bigger, his more private work, he shot with a very large format camera. He fought, shot it with an 8x10, so the back of the camera is 8 inches by 10 inches. So it could produce very large prints. I was very lucky that I got to speak briefly at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art about Richard Avedon a few years back, about six or seven years ago. And this is a picture from that ex exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. So very, very large work. So if we looked at his work, at Richard Avedon's work, for the most part, his work is a lot of its portraits, you know, so he's going to take a lot of pictures of people. His work is probably going to most of the time feature the fact that it's going to be um, on a white or gray background and it's have the black edges around the picture. Again, he's showing you these black edges to be able to make sure you understand that he's not cropping the picture. He shot them exactly as he's showing them to you. So very influential, but wanted to get a little deeper than just your normal um, uh, skin surface type thing. So that's Richard Avedon in a nutshell. Hope you enjoyed it.